Well, hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on, on where you are uh, in the world. My name is Jean-Baptiste Jouffre. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University. And it's my pleasure today uh, to be talking to you all uh, about the uh, narrow topic that is science for complex marine socio-ecological system in, in 15 minutes. Um, so given the scope of it, obviously, uh, we can touch upon everything. So the idea is to start with a little bit of the big picture of what is this complex marine social ecological system at a global scale, um, and then try to discuss uh, examples of what kind of science can uh, help make sense of it. But if we start with the big picture, as I said, uh, let's start with the Anthropocene which is this idea of, of a new epoch where humans have become a dominant force of planetary change. Um, so pervasive all over uh, the planet. And what characterized the Anthropocene, it's not uh, specifically when it started, and this is quite controversial in case of what's the beginning of the Anthropocene, but regardless whether you agree on a date or whether you, you even consider it a new geological epoch, where it's very useful is as an analytical framework to explore and understand what the changes we're seeing means from a social ecological perspective and how we can steer them towards a more sustainable and equitable future. That's the approach I take with the Anthropocene. It's characterized by speed, by scale, and by connectivity, the three of them being unprecedented in human history. And maybe one of the most iconic illustration of uh, the, this idea of the Anthropocene is the great acceleration, uh, the work by Stefan and, and colleagues that shows an exponential increase in a wide range of socioeconomic and earth system trends with a sharp increase from the 1950s um, where, where across the board uh, it's skyrocketing. Another, wait, I lost it. Yeah, sorry. Um, another way to conceptualize it, and more recently published, is the idea of a global production ecosystem. Um, that is the result of three trends. The conversion of the Earth biosphere into simplified production ecosystem, the increased intensification and dependence of these production ecosystems on human inputs, that's the whole notion of, of uh, intensifying and optimizing production, and of course they're expanding connectivity through global market. And you can see on the figure here that it integrates multiple sectors, right? Whether it's agriculture, aquaculture, fisheries, forestry. This is here with a focus on, on harvestable biomass. Um, and if you look at it from more of a resilience perspective, uh, through the lenses of connectivity, diversity, and feedback, which are principles of, of resilience, you realize that this global production ecosystem has become hyper-connected, uh, globally homogenized, and with weak feedback. And this has, uh, this has consequences. One of them is the global land use change that has been talked about previously uh, today. The economic globalization and to some extent sometimes the looming land scarcity. As, as we are consuming more, um, we need more resources. And in parallel to this, uh, we're seeing rapid technological innovation, particularly in the marine realm, which gives us access to resources and a domain that were unthinkable even 20 years ago and, and not least 50 years ago. Here's an illustration on, on the top left of like a seabed mining prototype machinery, right? That actually have been built while we're going down to 11,000 meters below the sea and starting farming offshore as well. So the result of this is that you have growing aspiration for the ocean as the next frontier for human development. And you can see it in the media, right? The ocean could be the new gold rush. It can provide food, it can provide fresh water if we desalinate, it can tackle climate change. It's the, it's the treasure for new antibiotics or new medicines. It's also communication, oil and gas, technology, mining, and so on and so on. It's all over the place and it's overwhelming and usually gather until the umbrella of a blue economy. Um, what we did in a recent paper was to try to really systematically map every single of those aspirations that we have on the ocean and categorize them under three broad needs of humanity, which are food, material, and space. And under those categories, you can see that we really are going for the ocean for a wide range of resources or needs, uh, from seafood 
to feeds for, for all the type of food, to oil and gas, minerals, fresh water, as I say, genetic resources, and of course, a lot of this ocean space used for pipelines, cables, shipping, and so on. If you look at the trend of those different ocean claims <laughs> that humanity is making, uh, well, it's, it looks familiar, right? And, and we called it the blue acceleration very much in the spirit of Stefan works on the great acceleration. You see the same pattern across the wide range of ocean uses. Um, but starting a little bit later, this really takes off at the onset of, of the 21st century with a sharp increase that characterizes a, a new human relationship with the ocean that is once again unprecedented. And this is what you could call the Anthropocene Ocean. Um, we are moving into the ocean, we're expanding into the ocean at an exponential rate and across a wide range of sectors. And of course, same as on land, this comes at a cost. Um, those are only a few, but, but they are quite iconic. This is a dead zone uh, in Rio de Janeiro with millions of fish dead. This is a bleaching, bleached corals in Indonesia. We're seeing more and more of those frequency and intensity of hurricanes and heat waves are increasing. And of course, the issue of marine plastic that has been mentioned already with, with the stomach content of a black-footed albatross in Hawaii that's being pictured here. So the real question is how to make sense uh, of this new reality. Like how do we, as scientists, what kind of science <laughs> is needed to grasp the complexity of this new ocean reality? And I would start by mentioning this, this idea of a biosphere-based sustainability science. So on the left here, you have the conventional view of the three pillars of what sustainability should be. And it's supposedly at the intersection of the environment, the society, and the economy. However, a bit more <laughs> later on, what was suggested was to, to flip over that diagram and to actually acknowledge that without a functioning biosphere, you do not have a functioning society. And then only then can you have a functioning economy. So this is, this is a small tweak, but it's a, it's a really important one in the framing uh, to recognize that both the economy and society are actually embedded within the biosphere. Uh, they are intertwined and they need the biosphere to be able to, to flourish which is different from seeing them as independent and intersecting. And this is something you, you find a lot in the visualization of the 14, 17 Sustainable Development Goals, right? And here it's goal 14, life below water, that is the focus of this slide. But it really communicates that you need those four SDG about life below water, life on land, clean water, and climate action before you can even consider uh, tackling the no poverty, sustainable diets, and so on before you can consider maybe decent work and economic growth. So you have this hierarchy where the biosphere is, is very foundational and at the bottom. So this is one mind shift that is increasingly needed, uh, both from the science side, but also from the policy and civil society. It's to recognize this embedness of, of planet people. Another aspect that is needed um, is to extend famous and, and well-known framework to the marine realm. So I'm thinking about the, the planetary, planetary boundaries concept, for instance, that was published more than a decade ago now. And this paper, uh, three years ago, making the point that you need to better integrate marine system within the planetary boundaries framework. Otherwise, you're missing key variables that, co that contributes to, to ecosystem biomes. And you're seeing that with the IPCC as well, moving very much in the right direction with the, the special report on the cryosphere on, on the ocean that was published uh, last year, I believe, uh, that really had a sole focus on the ocean uh, rather than terrestrial system. So there is this need to move and to better integrate um, the marine dynamics. Then, of course, uh, you can think of new ecological paradigms. Um, and here the idea is to say that, well, human social, cultural, and economic processes must become an integral part of ecological theory and practice as much as biological, geological, and physical processes are today. It's a bit of a long sentence, uh, but what it captures is the idea that if you look back maybe 200, 300 years ago on the left, this is what your typical 
core reef to take one ecosystem in particular core reef ecosystem would look like it would mostly be driven by biophysical forcing right natural variables such as seawater temperature primary production wave energy and then you would have a little bit of effluent maybe and subsistence fishing but you could predict your reef ecosystem based on those biophysical variables well, what a bunch of researchers have shown is that now if you look at your reef ecosystem and if you try to predict its states based on biophysical variables, you won't predict anything. And it's much better predicted if you take into consideration the myriad of anthropogenic pressure that are now surround reefs. So the biophysical forcing still are there and they still matter, but they are superimposed by a wide network and a complex network of both um, direct pressure and indirect, more distal pressure, thinking of human migration, urbanization, trade, of course, and, and, and climate change, among other. And it's, it's really this idea. I think there is a, another example is a, a study a couple of years ago that looked at the distribution of the lizard species across islands. And if they were trying to model this distribution by applying biogeography theories of species distribution, they couldn't explain anything, almost, of, of the distribution of the lizard. And then they overlaid the shipping routes. And suddenly they reached 80, 90 percent of predictive ability of their model in explaining the distribution of the lizard. So we have to accept that. We have to accept that maybe ecological paradigms that were developed and valid 50 years ago need to be revisited. Uh, that doesn't mean they're not valid any longer, but that means they need to be complemented. So there's a lot of work here to to integrate the human, cultural, and economic dimensions to ecology itself. Another way to look at it um, is, is this paper entitled Marine Ecosystem Science on an Intertwined Planet by Osterblom and colleague that really shows a little bit the same spirit that you do have your marine system and then you have this layer of proximate direct interaction and that could be different type of pressure from fishing pollution to, to ocean acidification. And then those ones are ultimately dictated by a more distal set of, uh, of interaction, going from geopolitics to finance to technology, human migration. And that you really need to look across that whole spectrum to actually make sense of what's happening in your marine ecosystem. If you just look at your one species and just look at one stressor, you will miss a lot of the picture. And that doesn't mean you need to be able and have the skills to do all of that yourself. But I think it talks and it speaks to the capacity of collaborating uh, increasingly to address the challenges we're facing. And that's spontaneously the first step would be interdisciplinary research, right? I have my own skills. I have my own domain of expertise. How do I collaborate with another scientist that has different skills and can bring a different expertise? That's the idea with interdisciplinary research. Uh, an example I really like is, is this opinion piece published a couple of years ago in Trends in Ecology and Evolution saying, well, why ecologists should care about financial markets, right? That's not, at the time especially, well, that wasn't a very straightforward, uh, and there was no straightforward answer. And there was making the point that ecologists should care. And then two years later came this one, why finance should care about ecology, and it was written by a professor in finance, making the other way around and arguing that finance should actually look more into ecology. And so we, we actually reached out to that professor in finance, Bert Scholtens, and wrote together an article called Leverage Points in the Financial Sector for Seafood Sustainability that really was bringing a truly interdisciplinary effort with scholars from sustainability, natural sciences, finance, and accounting in trying to tackling the, the challenges of, of sustainability within the seafood sector and identifying uh, three key leverage points where if sustainability criteria were, were taken into consideration, could really transform the way finance incentivizes uh, better practices. Now, beyond interdisciplinary lies transdisciplinary research. And I think this is the, the most relevant, maybe in the context of, of this introductory webinar, about science policy society interface, because the idea of transdisciplinary research is to move beyond the bridging of academic disciplines to also engage with society with stakeholders such as policy, governments, or civil society actors, and to co-produce knowledge. So it's not just a top-down science to stakeholder, but it's really capitalizing on a wide variety of knowledge. It's, it's what Maria Tenge called the multiple evidence-based approach, right, which tries to synthesize and harness 
all kind of different knowledge, recognizing that they all have value and they enrich what you can do and how you can solve problems. Albert Nordstrom at the beginning of the year and other people, including Chris, that we will talk after, uh, published also this paper about principles for knowledge co-production in sustainability research, right? How do, how do you go about co-production? Because it can be quite intimidating when you're in, in your scientific ivory towers to just break the walls and, and engage engage with uh, real world. <laughs> and so they light up a set of principle uh, arguing they need to be context-based, the, the, the co-production needs to be context-based, it needs to be pluralistic, of course, recognizing the different knowledge and the different people around the table, goal-orientated and interactive. Uh, which brings me to the fact that if, if you want to interact, please raise your hands and engage uh, after the presentation. I would be more than happy to, to discuss with you, and so will Chris. Another example of that uh, is this uh, emergence of a global science business initiative for ocean stewardship, like the seafood business for ocean stewardship, CBOS initiative that was created four years ago when a group of scientists decided to engage with the 10 largest seafood companies in the world. And that's quite unusual because when you think of co-production of knowledge, you often think of traditional knowledge, which is absolutely critical, or small scale artisanal fishers, for instance. Um, but the, the big transnational corporations are often seen as the evil, right? It's like this, this is the industry. Yet the private sector is uh, crucial if we are to shift into a more sustainable world. So in a, in a paper over the summer, um, again, like we discussed this, like science industry collaboration, is it a sideway or highways to ocean sustainability? And we really ponder the pro and cons because I think uh, it's promising, but ones need to be aware of, of the caveats to engage with such powerful and influential actors, of course, but worth exploring. And this is my uh, final slide um, to conclude and, and give the floor to, to Chris, who will talk more about the type of scientist uh, that is needed to, to conduct that research. And this is a quote from Robert Cates, uh, the father of sustainability, you could say, um, who argued that sustainability science is a different kind of science that is primarily use inspired with significant fundamental and applied knowledge components and committed to moving such knowledge into societal action. And I think his point is that the real test of success of sustainable science will be in implementing its knowledge to meet the great environment and development challenges of this century. So how do we do that? And how can scientists, whether early career, mid career or late career, actually become change makers? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Drasko. And hello, everybody. Um, First of all, I just want to thank Katarina and Peter and Andrea and others for inviting me to talk today. It's really nice to be here. Um, it's night time for me and it's getting late, so I'm drinking lots of coffee to keep up with you all. Um, a couple of things I guess you need to know about me. As Peter said, I tend to hide in people's spam boxes. So if you get an email from me, it tends to go straight to your junk, so check there. Um, I guess the important thing you need to know about me is a lot of my research is about how we bridge this science policy interface. So how can I look at how we can help scientists and decision makers of different types work together more effectively um, for evidence informed decision making. And ironically today I'm not going to be talking that much about that. Um, I'm actually going to be talking about a different, different type of scientist for a different type of science. Oh, the last thing I should mention is in Australia, I come from Northern Australia where we talk fast and we don't pronounce things properly. So JB's promised me if I talk too fast, he'll let me know. So JB just gave a really good background into the different types of science we need. The scale, the complexity and the interconnectedness of the challenges facing marine ecosystems are significant and they're gonna have a significant impact. They're already having a significant impact on society, on our well-being, on our future, on our prosperity. But the challenge is, if we need to do a different type of science, then we need a different type of scientist. We don't need scientists necessarily anymore who can just work within their single disciplines. We need scientists who can work across disciplines to be able to integrate natural and social sciences, as an example. We need scientists who can work across knowledge systems, who can bridge cultural knowledge with experiential knowledge, for example, the knowledge that a policymaker might have, with local community knowledge and to connect that with scientific knowledge to give a more holistic picture about what we can know. 
We also need scientists who can facilitate knowledge exchange, who can work at the interface between marine science and policy, which I guess is what Venice is going to hopefully help us all do a little bit better. And we need scientists that can support evidence-informed policy and practice and help us to actually have a real impact on the world around us. And it goes back to the point Andrea made before, that the accumulation of scientific knowledge is good, but it's not enough. It's how we apply that knowledge to make a difference. And increasingly, all of these things, all of these attributes are actually linked to our career success as scientists now. So it's becoming more, you know, we used to be measured just on their number of publications, but increasingly more and more, we're seeing evidence that to be promoted, to get tenure, um, and to have a long-term academic career, you need to be able to demonstrate these types of abilities and skills. Um, but the challenge is, right, we're not really trained how to do this. So scientific training, for the most part, is still confined to a single discipline, um, and to the rules and norms of a single discipline. So I originally started life as a coral reef ecologist, and I knew nothing about social science. I didn't know what epistemology was. I didn't know what positionality was. I knew nothing about the field. And Chris, this makes it really hard Chris, to work. Yeah. I'm sorry. We uh, we received a message in the chat that people can cannot hear you very well. So if you can please just get a little bit closer to the microphone. Yeah. Is that better? Uh, I don't know. Marta has to tell us. Is that better, Marta? Yes, thanks, she says. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, and so it's not easy. And so if we have a look at this figure, for example, different scientists from different disciplines will be looking at the same system. So if we look at the fisheries, a natural scientist, for example, might ask how many species and what biomass comprise the bycatch of the fishery? Whereas a social scientist could ask anything from how many fishes adopt seasonal climate forecasts to what's the influence of masculine culture on fishing practices? And so it's really hard to engage across these types of questions if we don't understand another discipline. Another big problem with scientific training doesn't include a focus on the development of what we call soft skills, so things like team building leadership. And it's also problematic because integrative research can take longer, it can be harder to publish, it's harder to get funded, and it presents us with reputational risk, particularly for early and mid-career stages, and particularly if we're in organisations that don't recognise or reward the different challenges we're facing. At the same time, we're expected to impact across policy and practice, and we need scientists that can. But we use this analogy of a mountain because reaching policy impact is actually really hard. It's like climbing a mountain, and there's multiple pathways up that mountain, and we're not trained in how to do it. We're not taught what is policy or what is an impact or how can science be used in policy. And to do that, it's like requiring an understanding of a whole new ecosystem with actors, networks, institutions, contexts, ideas. And most training, most academic training, PhDs and so forth, don't currently prepare us for this. And so it can be really intimidating for early and mid-career um, researchers to know where to start. And then I guess the last thing, and this is going to be a bit of a personal, personal story, when we're expected to be a new type of scientist, sometimes it's really hard to know who you are. So as I said, I started as an ecologist and when I shifted to social science, I told my boss, my ecologist boss, and he literally told me that you've sold your soul to join the dark side. For the next five minutes, he continued to tell me that social scientists, social science has no rigor. It's just someone's opinion. It's not real science. And he told me that I should try and get a real job. I tell you this anecdote because sometimes as we try to work across disciplines and as JB was talking with different partners like industry um, or environmental non-government organisations, it can test our integrity and it can make our peers think differently about us. And it's something that we have to know how to manage. But what I want to tell you is that it's hard, but it's worth it. So what we're starting to see more and more is what we call bright spots. So bright spots are outliers that perform better than we would expect. So for science policy, it's evidence or situations where science does inform policy. In Australia, we've seen examples around recovery of albatross from climate change and a strong fishery sector around southern bluefin tuna. And through these, we're starting to learn how to do things better and particularly how to bring early and mid-career researchers, how to empower them to do it better as well. Um, so the challenge is, how do we get more of these bright spots and how do we build the capacities to help early and mid-career and all scientists like JB mentioned do this better? Um, I'm going to quickly whip around a few of these, draw on these two papers. If you can't access 
them. I know different people have troubles accessing um, databases. Please just flick me an email or a message on Twitter and I'll send them to you. Um, but really I want to highlight some of the skills we need as a segue. And then when we get to Croatia, oh, Croatia, sorry, where the first workshop was held, when we get to Venice, um, we'll go into the detail of how we actually do these things on a practical level. So the first thing to do and be a new type of scientist, we need to have an area of our expertise. We need to know what you bring to a table. So one of the world leading interdisciplinary researchers told us, I think to be interdisciplinary, you need to be a specialist at something. It could be a discipline, it could be a place, it could be a field of study, or it could be a method. But you need to know what you bring to the table and have your reputation in your field. You need to know how to express your field, your jargon, your technical expertise in ways that other people can understand. And this point's gonna come up a lot. You do this by seeking to understand and then be understood. And using things like metaphors and analogies. You need to be open-minded. Um, you know, one of the big ones is around sample size. I, it's not uncommon for me to publish papers now with a sample size of 15. But if I get a very quantitative reviewer, they'll tear me apart and tell me that that's not real science. So we need to be open to understanding the norms and practices of other disciplines to bring them together. Um, and we need to be open-minded to new ways of doing things. We need to be patient. Um, delivering a new type of science, the type of science JB was talking about, it takes time and it takes patience. And again, particularly for earlier and mid-career researchers, particularly in the current world where jobs have been tested, where we're forced to publish more and um, have impact less, we really need to try and manage the patience of how long this stuff takes versus the reward systems we operate within. And we need institutional change to enable that. And we need to appreciate it is gonna be hard. We need to embrace the complexity. Ambiguity and complexity actually lets us try new things like the CBOS example that JB just spoke about. It helps us be creative. And it lets us actually push our disciplinary knowledge and boundaries in really innovative ways. And again, that finance example that JB gave us really illustrates that. Um, and we need to take the time to work through these complexities and make sure all values and knowledge bases are respected and reflected in the work that we do. We also need to push your boundaries. This stuff makes us feel uncomfortable and I think that's good. I think mean, nothing easy ever made a real big difference and the more uncomfortable we feel, we're probably working on something a bit harder and a bit more significant. And again, this is another quote from a world leading interdisciplinary researcher. Um, I'm completely ignorant of different theory. I think in some ways you've got to be brave and be able to interact in these spaces where you know nothing. So as I said, when we get to Croatia, <laughs> when we get to Venice, the focus will be on actually developing the practical skills to actually be all of these things to apply them in our work. Um, the last point I'm going to leave you on, guys, is that we need to accept the mistakes do happen and we need to not give up. Trying to be a new type of scientist, trying to be a new, trying to do a new type of science, trying to engage with policy and different stakeholders, trying to influence policy, it's really bloody hard and you fail. And fail, failure is really important because failure gives us a chance to learn. So what we need to do is be resilient. We need to keep giving it a crack and keep trying. We need to remember why we're doing what we're doing and push through some of those difficulties because over time you will make a difference. And I can honestly say that across my career, all the really significant or a lot of the really significant impacts that I've seen have come where early career, mid-career people have been involved. Um, and a big part of this, as I've sort of reiterated a few times, is staying humble and never stop learning. I just want to reiterate this, seek first to understand and then be understood. And obviously attending this webinar and the course and everything else is the first step in that. Um, so as I said, that's a bit of a crash course of into some of the things we'll cover in Venice, not Croatia. Um, and I'll leave it there, guys.